In the early hours of March 23rd, 2012, a raid took place at the Loomis Cash Depot in Swanley, Kent. A digger had broken through the wall. A gang who were armed with baseball bats and white sacks climbed over the rubble only to find an empty room. They then entered a nearby warehouse only to find that was empty too and fled less than a minute later. They then botched their guests away when they had to abandon their car in a field when it got stuck in the mud. After launching an investigation, Kent police found an abandoned Mitsubishi 4x4 in a field near a farm. The vehicle had become grounded on a dip, but inside officers found a two-way radio, a baseball bat and large white bags. In a nearby bush, a balaclava, a snood and a running stopwatch were also found, which allowed officers to calculate the time on the stopwatch and link it to the attempted robbery. Ray Betson of Clifton Crescent, Folkestone, was arrested on December the 5th when police found his DNA on discarded balaclava at the scene. On July the 18th, Betson was found guilty of attempted robbery at Maystone Crown Court and was sentenced to 13 years in prison. Ray Betson never gave up any of his accomplices and no other gang members from the Loomis raid have been caught. Betson tried to break into Swan Lee Depot only months after being released from jail. He was the notorious gang leader of the Dome Raiders. He led the team of villains who made headlines around the world in an audacious smash and grab at the Dome, now known as the O2 Arena. The Dome Raiders smashed through the entrance of the Millennium Dome on converted JCB digger to his sledgehammers and smoke grenades and then smashed open a glass cabinet. They boasted they would never be caught and pride themselves on the meticulous planning to keep one step ahead of the law, using state-of-the-art technology and anti-surveillance devices. But just like the dome itself, the raid ended in failure. Betson was jailed in 2002 for a maximum of 18 years in prison for his part in the raid. His sentence was later reduced to 15 years. With the weekend in their sights, a pair of security call drivers hopped into their van carrying £9 million, their final rounds of the week. They passed morning commuters as they wound their way through the industrial estate near Maidstone. But no more than 500 metres in, a blue Ford Transit screeched to a halt in front of them, while a truck blocked them in from behind. Moments later, an articulated lorry with a spike fitted to its back crashed into the security van's rear doors. The nine raiders attempting to break in after the cash inside. As the robbery ensued, two police officers arrived, gunshots were fired, and the masked robbers fled, thwarted. They were driven to a speedboat less than a mile away, which carted them along a river medway, away from the glare of the law. Dozens of officers joined their colleagues at the scene. They watched as members of the bomb squad approached a suspected homemade mine that had been attached to a security van in a bid to frighten the drivers. But rather than being explosives, the bemused officers realised they were Frey Bentos steak and kidney pie containers, obscured by a coat of paint. They were covered with flashing LED lights, so they looked like explosive devices. The tins caused problems because they had the whole area cooled off until the explosive team came in and had a look. The security call vehicle had nowhere to go once it stopped. The robbers drove over in a lorry that had a huge metal spike concreted to it. The idea was you'd stick it through the rear doors, then put a rod through and pull the doors off. As the robbery progressed, police got called by witnesses. There were two shots fired. The police officer commented, I hadn't really seen operations coordinated as that. It was very old fashioned. We don't get many with that level of planning. They're generally less much sophisticated. Forensic teams managed to lift saliva from the gloves in the getaway van. Bullets were salvaged from the scene and the vehicles used were found to be stolen. We faked tax discs. All of these were produced in a similar way, stuck to their windscreens. All but two of the criminal motors had petrol bombs taped up inside. They intended on torching them to destroy any forensic evidence. But it was the words daubed on the girders of the makeshift battering ram that attracted the attention of the flying squad. 
The words Gertie Mark II, persistent, aren't we? There's a bit of a calling card. The name Gertie, which remains a mystery, had been discovered on another security call raid in Nine Elms, London, five months before. As in Alsford, the raiders used a metal spike in an attempt to tear through a security van's doors, behind which lay £10 million. But again, they were forced to abort the operation and escaped empty handed. Despite making one arrest in a connection with the summer raid, detectives made slow progress with their investigation. The only lead that was provided was a source who told them a person called Terry was involved in the heist. It gave no leads. That was until a man drunkenly lost control of his car and drove into a pub in Tunbridge Wells on August the 17th. The driver was villain Terry Millman. He was an armed robber. The vehicle was stolen and it had the same forged tax disc as the one in the Alsford robbery. There was a lot of activity in the Flying Squad offices because they found a main player in the gang. He was a character. He was an old style criminal, incredibly loyal and probably a bit of a liability. Millman's fingerprints matched three found during the Alsford raid. Detectives also discovered that he regularly traveled to Kent in order to visit the Wenhams a family of horse traders, at their farms in Horsmanden and Brenchley. They mixed with some quite colourful characters and they would have seemed like lovable rogues. Identifying Millman was a potential link of the two robberies. The police decided to let him run and watch where he went. Covert cameras months before had been placed in discreet locations surrounding the farm after police started to suspect Lee Wenham of car ringing. While reviewing the tapes, officers realised they had captured footage showing the lorry with the concrete spike leaving the Brenchley plot on the day of the Alsford robbery. Police believed those involved in the two foul plots, which were both costly and time-consuming to organise, would be readying themselves for another job, and the following month, Wenham was observed visiting the Millennium Dome. Having travelled from Kent to Greenwich, he spent just six minutes inside. Police were watching. There was an awful lot of conjecture among the flying squad. Why on earth would he go there? And some genius said there's a diamond in there. That was the first inkling they had that they wanted to steal it. A De Beers diamond exhibition was on display inside South East London site. The collection was worth about 350 million and they included the price of a Selenium star. If the robbers were successful, that had undertaken one of the most audacious heists of all time. A detective based at the dome also spotted by chance two known criminals, Raymond Betson, who owned a luxury home in Chatham, and Catford's William Cockrum, filming the entrance to the money zone and the jewels on display. They later met a third man there, Aldo Scirocco. Ray Betson notched up his first conviction at the age of 14 for burglary. He reportedly made 15 million from thieving and drug deals. The flying squad suspecting a raid was in the offing, wanted to catch the gang red handed. The Millennium Star was moved to De Beers, London headquarters and replaced with a worthless fake. By this point, surveillance officers at Tong Farm in Brenchley had also noticed the arrival of a speedboat that had been bought by Millman, who used the alias Mr. T Diamond in Whitstable. Police were on edge. They knew it was going to happen on a number of occasions. One day, the JCB got involved in an accident on the way to the dome. He also got the tides wrong. It wasn't a seamless job by any means. After 8am on November the 7th, the gang speedboat was spotted in the Thames. The JCB left a coal yard near the dome and trudled towards the venue. Its digger raised with four members of the gang on board. He flattened the perimeter fence and played through the wall of the dome. The raiders were all wearing gas masks, then used a nail gun and a sledgehammer to smash the glass display before releasing ammonia and several smoke grenades into the air. But the robbers were overpowered by dozens of armed officers within inches of the jewels. In all more, 200 police officers and detectives, many of whom were disguised as bystanders and cleaners, were involved in the operation, codenamed Magician. More London officers stationed outside the venue arrested two other suspects, one waiting a high-powered boat on the Thames and another thought to be tracking radio frequencies. 
no shots were fired. Six more men, including Wenham, were arrested following the morning at Horsbundon in the village of Collar Street near Maystone during raids of the Wenham's farms. They found laundry bags, which were believed to be intended to get the money away from Alsford, reflective coats, a newspaper dated August the 6th, bearing Millman's fingerprints, shotgun cartridges, tabards, and a Smith & Wesson revolver. Robert Adams had no fixed address, and Shiroki, from Bermondsey, was sentenced to 15 years following the trial in the Old Bailey. Terry Millman, who was 57 years old, died of cancer in November 2001, before the trial took place. Lee Wenham was ordered to serve nine years in prison for conspiring to seal the gems of his part of the Alsford plot. All charges against his father, James Wenham, were dropped. Kevin Meredith, the speedboat driver, was jailed for five years after being found guilty of conspiracy to steal. And Betson and Cockrum, who had been considered the masterminds of the raid, had their 18-year sentences later reduced to 15. But however, as we've seen in the start, Betson was jailed again in 2014 for 13 years, following a bungled security raid at Loomis Depot. The police detective said they got caught, never really whinged about it, and those who got convicted did their time. There wasn't a love-hate relationship between us and them. It was just all fairly good spirits in general. They were old style. Imagine the planning that goes into this. If it all goes wrong, you get nothing and you get 17 years. There's got to be an easy way of doing things with less risk. Like cybercrime. And I'm sure that's why we don't get many of these old style crooks like we used to.